Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and ever. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. Your gates will always be open by day or night. They will never be shut. God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery, made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet Martin Luther King, may resist oppression in the name of your love, may secure for all your children the blessed liberty, the gospel of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Listen to me, O coastlands, Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born, while I was in my mother's womb. He named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us.
the holy gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of the one holy and living God. Amen. Please. <clears throat> Theologian Howard Thurman said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and do it, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. In an excellent thought-provoking book called Quarter Life, Satya Doyle Bayak observes that the common expectation for our life's trajectory envisions that in early years of adulthood, we put our energy into steps that create purpose and stability. We go to school, figure out a career, embark upon it, and you find a partner or mate and start a family, and off we go. And according to this pattern, it is after we have created the direction, the container for our lives, that we may awake one day down the road in something of a crisis and ask, what's the meaning of it all? I feel restless. I climbed the ladder, but to what end am I being true to myself? So meaning-making, it is thought, comes in the second half. 
Well, Bayok, a Jungian analyst, questions this paradigm. With attention focused on what she calls quarter lifers, those in the first quarter, somewhere between late teens and early 30s, Bayok observes that while the common pattern works for those more naturally inclined to seek and create stability, there's a sizable number of us who are more naturally driven to discern or create meaning first before we have much of any interest in or can give any attention to stability. She writes, quarter lifers have typically imbibed a whole host of contradictory messages around how to be an adult, namely to be functional and successful, but also popular and attractive, wealthy and famous, intelligent and interesting, creative and entrepreneurial, but not self-involved or selfish, nor privileged or cruel or unaware of the world's pain. <clears throat> So, in order to abide by these competing implicit and explicit directions, none of which are about genuine self-knowledge or self-care, quarter-lifers can become profoundly disoriented. In contrast, the more that quarter-lifers explore the information of their bodies and histories, their old traumas and stress, and their own points of desire and longing, the more they'll learn to hear what their hearts know about their future." End quote. Now, Bayok has me thinking about how we in the church create space, holy space, that supports young people and quarter-lifers of every stripe as they explore and blossom as beloved of God, paying attention most especially to those in society who, as Howard Thurman says, have their backs against the wall. But she's also prompted me to think about the expectations I set for my own children now in their early 30s, as well as to look back at the choices that I made along the way and the support I experienced or didn't in those choices. Because as many of us have discovered, becoming fully alive, it's not a one-time event. In our texts today and in the lives of the prophets, we're presented with the idea that one's calling in life is foreordained, preordained. John the Baptist tells us of his singular purpose to point the way toward Jesus. Here he is, said John. I did not know him, but I came so that he might be revealed. He says it again. I didn't know Jesus, but the one who sent me told me that it would be the one on whom the Spirit descended and remained. And again, John said to others, Here he is. And two who heard, Andrew and Peter, followed Jesus. John's calling in life was to point the way to Jesus. He was born for this. He died for this. Isaiah, too, was called from the beginning. Before I was born... While I was in my mother's womb, the Lord named me, and then gives us this beautiful tender image as a polished arrow in his quiver, the Lord hid me away. But now Isaiah's calling and purpose is expanding. It is not enough that you raise up the tribes of Judah and Israel, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Calling is a, it's a freighted term, and it may feel unhelpful to consider our own lives 
in the light of great souls such as Isaiah or John the Baptist. Nonetheless, I expect we each have a deeply felt sense of when we are being true to ourselves. Just as we know deeply when we're out of alignment, feeling restless, and when we're being untrue to ourselves, we're probably also being untrue to those nearest to us, those around us. Here I'm thinking of calling not in the narrow sense of religious vocation, I'm thinking more broadly in terms of how each one of us seeks to discover and engage our own particular gifts for our own wholeness as beloved of God and perchance as a blessing to others. One way to frame this is to ask, what is the unique way I was created to give and receive love in this world? Now, Frederick Beekner's well-known definition of vocation as the place where our deep gladness meets the world's deep need raises the truth that it's not just about me finding my way. It's not just about us. It's not enough to be some version of fat and happy or fit and healthy. Dr. King often said that we're caught in a network of inescapable mutuality. Thus, he affirmed in one of his commencement addresses, strangely enough, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you cannot be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. Even if we achieve and gain everything we want, at some point the world or those we love will break our hearts and we will learn painfully, blessedly, that we're never ever alone. I've known many people who have discovered along the way that when they exercise their own gifts, it seems to benefit others more than themselves. I think of someone with a giant compassionate heart whose heart is always breaking as they reach out in love, or an artist who's so devoted to and driven by their creative expression that other relationships in their life languish. Novelist Susan Howitch provides what I find a memorable phrase, that these are costly charisms. Costly charisms. I found, too, that it's, it's debatable as to whether finding our true calling necessarily results in feeling good. I mean, I'm all for feeling in sync, in flow, catching those waves when our heart, body, mind, and relationships all seem to come together. But God is equally present in the holiness of our struggles, in our diminishments, in our, our so-called failings and weaknesses. Are these not just as precious and potent as our successes and strengths? Our weaknesses, our foolishness, these are opportunities for God's grace. So also, even if we feel clear and settled in our sense of purpose and call, the need to renegotiate and perhaps start over carries on through every generation, every season, at any age. A sudden twist, a loss of love, a newfound love, an imagined path or future no longer present or viable for some unforeseen reason. It's just dropped away. Well into our 80s and beyond, the loss of a spouse or a sudden physical ailment, leaving a familiar home and community can prompt existential questions about why, why am I even 
alive? What am I doing here in this life of mine? Oh God, speak to me anew. At every age, discerning our call can be both daunting and exhilarating. It can prompt feelings of extraordinary loss and of new lands found. If you believe, as I do, that God is present in and speaking to and in the midst of every aspect of our lives, this is a most holy, holy task. I'll close with a story. It's told by Jack Cornfield. story of a tribe in East Africa in which the birth date of a child is not counted from the day of its physical birth or even the day of its conception. The birth date comes from the first time the child is thought in its mother's mind. Aware of her intention to conceive a child, the mother goes off to sit alone under a tree. And there she sits and listens until she can hear the song of the child that she hopes to conceive. And once she has heard it, she returns to her village and teaches it to the father so that they can sing it together as they make love, inviting the child to join them. And after the child is conceived, she sings it to the baby in her womb. And then she teaches it to the old women and midwives of her village so that throughout the labor and the miraculous moment of birth itself, this child is greeted with its song. And after the birth, all the villagers learn the song of their new member, and they sing it to the child when it falls or hurts itself It's sung in times of triumph or in rituals and initiations. The song becomes part of the marriage ceremony when the child is grown. And at the end of life, his or her loved ones will gather around the deathbed and sing this song for the last time. As God said to the prophets, so God says to you, And to me, before you were knit together in your mother's womb, I knew you, saith our God. I set you apart. What is your song? Let us sing it with you. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, one being the Father.
Gracious and loving God, you see into the deepest needs of our hearts and invite us to follow you, to listen to your voice. Receive our prayers as we call upon you. Loving one, you visit us in friendship and invite your church to be generous and hospitable, neighbors to all. Fill us with your grace that we may be a community of kindness and compassion. Guide our efforts as we continue to understand and dismantle the effects of racism in the church. O oh God of light, hear our prayers. Eternal one, you search our hearts and know us. Lay your hand upon our nation and upon all in authority throughout the world that they may be instruments of your compassion and peace, and that we may be known as a people in whom there is no deceit. O oh God of light, wonderful creator, you have woven our bodies in the depths of the earth. Look upon the needs of a suffering world and bless all humanity, that your healthful spirit and presence may do marvelous works for the relief of the world. O oh God of light, good and holy God, you fashion our lives day by day in your spirit. Increase in us your vision that we may see your hand at work in our community. O oh God of light, We pray for all who are ill, especially Catherine, Anna Gardano, Ken Tassell, Bob Erskine, Jack, Rose, Lisa, Steve Coster, Marco, Lori, David Hadler, Robin Smith, Jeff Mascot, Peggy Wilson, Jack Ryan Connolly and family, Christy and all whose lives are in some way precarious, those who are in danger due to flooding in California, the people of Ukraine, and those we now name silently or aloud. O God of light, Accept our prayers of thanksgiving, especially, especially for the life and witness of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and those who have borne witness to justice in their time, the launch of new sacred ground groups, and those blessings we name now either silently or aloud. O oh God of light, hear our prayers. Welcome into your beloved community those who have died. We pray especially for Mary Louise Belts, Charlie Jeffress, Ernestine Latimer, Norma Drew, Ted Beatty, Nate Kelleher, Joe Beach, Richard Wiegman, Linda Bowden Lowe, and those we now name, either silently or aloud. O oh God of light, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with no gifts but ourselves. Accept and receive our lives that we may be manifestations of your presence. Let the light of your spirit shine within and among us, so we may share in the mystery of your purpose of blessing for all creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
Most merciful God, we confess that we have thought Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The peace of Christ be always with you. It is a great joy to welcome you to St. Columba's Church this morning, a special joy to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us for the very first time today. If you're here for the first time, thank you for joining us. We're really glad that you are here. Please help us welcome you by taking a moment now and fill out one of the welcome cards that you'll find in your pew, and you can place that in the offering plate as your gift to us today. St. Columba's is a church on a mission to live God's love. And we are eager to support you and one another as we seek different ways to carry that out. A couple of opportunities that are on the horizon. Uh, first of all, in this new year, our Wednesday night suppers are back and going. Please join us. Please bring a friend. Um, in order to make it work financially, we've increased the cost just ever so slightly. Uh, but we also welcome every Wednesday night a host of folks um, who are unable to pay. So if you do come, consider uh, paying for someone else to pay it forward. Um, also, I commend to your attention in the little insert, the connections insert, uh, two opportunities coming up. Uh, one is that the film being showed this Friday evening by Stirring the Waters. Um, take a look at that and join us for that. And also an invitation to those who may like to participate in one of our sacred ground circles. Uh, this is an offering that's been created by the Episcopal Church. Uh, small group gatherings, many of us have already had a chance to do it with reading and video and conversation about the place of race and racism in our lives, in our church, in our nation. I commend those to you. Lastly, if you're interested in exploring um, the life of the Episcopal Church, or St. Columbus in particular, uh, join us on Wednesday evenings for an inquirer's class. But now let us walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us a gift and sacrifice unto God. Thank you. 
God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our sovereign God. God of all blessing, we thank you for always making us in your image to serve the peace of all creation. You shared your name with our mothers and fathers, Sarah and Abraham, who left their home and became a blessing to all nations, Moses and Miriam, who went through sea and wilderness to the place of revelation, Deborah and Samson, who gave hope and justice to a people ruled by fear, Ruth and Jonah, who went to foreign soil and found a God who loves the stranger. From our ancestors in faith came Jesus, the son of promise, to fulfill the law, embody your love, and draw all people to himself. He accepted death to break its fearful hold, was raised to life to share it in abundance. He comes again to break the bread and pour the wine of hope. Therefore, with all people whose story you have shaped, with women and men of faith in every part of the world, we glory in your generous love and sing in praise to you. We ask that your Holy Spirit will fall upon us and upon these gifts, that these fragile earthly things may be to us the body and blood of our Lord and brother Jesus Christ, who on the night that he was betrayed gathered with his faltering friends for a meal that tasted of hope. Calling them to his table, Jesus took bread, gave thanks broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this wherever you drink it, remembrance of me. And so on that night, so here and now, Jesus offers all that he was, all that he is, all that he will be. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, we come in memory and hope, responding to your call and the promise that echoes from the dawn of all time. May mind and heart be held by your self-giving love as we stand before the cross, approach the empty tomb, and praise the one whose name is lifted high above all earthly power. Receive our broken offerings through your never-ending grace and bind us in communion with all who share your gifts. Through Almighty God, in whom from the beginning of time, through the great expanse of space, all things are drawn into the ceaseless love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ taught us, we now pray. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey of faith, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome at God's table. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace. Grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Christ's bright star enlighten your mind and heart as you strive for equality, justice, and kindness in the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, be among with you and remain with you always. Amen.
holding on to the sweet spirit of this place, let us go forth to live God's love. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, God.